evening and welcome to the WDSU News Hot Seat. I'm Travers Mackle. Last week was qualifying for all of the big elections coming up this fall in the city of New Orleans, and we are going to delve deep into the mayor's race in the city of New Orleans. Back for a second week, a familiar face, UNO political analyst Dr. Ed Shervenek. Thank you for being here once again. Thanks for having me. Let's just talk about the mayor's race. 18 people qualified. Was that expected given the fact that it's an open seat? Uh, I don't know if 18 was expected, uh, but certainly more than seven was expected initially. And, you know, that's with the number until the very last day right. of qualifying. And so people kept expecting, well, these should be more people. And they were thought there'd be more high profile, high profile individuals who would get involved because it is an open seat. Uh, and anytime there's an open seat, that's your best opportunity to grab it. Why did some of the high profile people stay out of it? Walt Leger's name was mentioned to state rep Karen Carter Peterson. Why did people like that stay out of the race? Uh, well, they've already got a position, they've already got a job, and so they don't want to give that job up. And they may just feel they're more effective in the state legislature than they would be, say, as, as mayor of New Orleans. Being mayor, you know, it comes with its rewards, but it also has a lot of risks. And, uh, you know, and we, because, you know, every decision you make is going to be criticized by someone. And, you're, you know, you're going to be criticized, you're going to be mocked. That's just the nature of being a chief executive of a city or a state or even the, the nation. Um, and I think a lot of it just had to do with the fact that, you know, there was some indecision and, well, this, you know, if this person ran, this other person wasn't going to run. And by the time it all came to fruition, they all decided they weren't going to run. Let's talk about the 18 candidates. You have a lot of people here. A 22-year-old from Algiers, a doctor, business people, a bar owner showed up from the French Quarter down there. He had a very interesting looking suit on. There have been three people that have been campaigning for a long time, at least several weeks. Former judges Michael Bagnaris and Desiree Charbonnet, as well as current city council member Latoya Cantrell. A lot of people look at them as the big three right now. Will it stay that way? Uh, they're probably the, the first tier candidates, I would call them. And then um, probably Troy Henry um, would probably be a second tier candidate given that he got in so late. So yeah, uh, the big three I'd be looking at uh, and also Troy Henry because he had run before in 2010. So he knows what it takes to run for mayor. Uh, he knows what it's gonna take to raise the money, what kind of organization he's gonna have to build. So um, we'll have to see what kind of candidacy he runs. If he can, if he can get, you know, get himself moved up into that first tier. Can anybody surprise? Can anybody come from the back of the pack here? Or are some of these people just going down there because they're interested in the process, they're mad at City Hall? Can anybody come from the back of the pack right now? At least, I know it's early, but right now, does it look like anybody can jump from the back of the pack to the top? I mean, anything is possible, but it's highly unlikely. Uh, the big three plus Troy Henry probably going to dominate in terms of being able to raise money uh, and also have the political muscle that's required in, other, in terms of organizational resources resources. Uh, these other candidates probably want to get their message out there more than anything else. I don't know if they really think they have a realistic shot at becoming mayor, uh, but they certainly have an agenda. So I, I just think that, you know, the, the top three and four have name recognition. The rest of these candidates do not. Well, let's talk about, let's continue to talk about these three, I guess, the three of the candidates that have been campaigning for a long time in the former, the two former judges and the city councilwoman, Latoya Cantrell, Michael Bignaris, Desiree Charbonnet. Michael Bignaris ran in 14. He knows what it takes. Here he is right here, some video. He knows what it takes to run a race. But right now, how does he stack up against these two female contenders? Uh, his biggest issue is his lack of name recognition, which I was really kind of surprised about. Um, the Bagnaris name is relatively well known in the city, but when we looked at the polls, uh, only about 55% of those people who responded to the poll said uh, they knew who he was, and 70% could not give an opinion about him, either favorable or unfavorable. So he needs, he has his work cut out for him in terms of raising his profile. We have some more video here, I believe we're gonna show you in just a second. Desiree Charbonnet, as well as Latoya Cantrell. Could we see two women in a runoff? New Orleans has never had a female mayor. Is this the year that Inevitably, you could see two women getting a runoff for the November uh, runoff election. It's, it's certainly a strong possibility, I believe. I, I, you know, I'm, I firmly believe that our next mayor is going to be female. It's going to be one of these two individuals. And so, yes, this will be his, historical as we come into our uh, 300th anniversary. So this may be a fundamental shift in New Orleans politics. What does Troy Henry do to this race? Does he hurt any of these candidates? Can he win? He jumped in late, even though he ran back into 2010. Some people still know who he is, but what effect does he have? 
I think the, the biggest effect he has is on Michael Bagneris. Um, I ran a, an analysis on Troy Henry's vote in 2010 and compared it to uh, Michael Bagneris's um, in 2014, and their vote is highly correlated at 0.84. So that tells me that the same people who were voting for Troy Henry were also voting for Michael Bagneris. So I think that's who he's really going to hurt. And it helps the two female candidates that are the two of the, I guess you can consider them front runners right now. They are the front runners. They're the first among equals. They've raised the most money and they probably have the strongest organizations out there. Um, it's hard to run an analysis on Desiree Charbonnet uh, and Latoya Cantrell. Um, there's just not enough data there to really look at them. You also have a good breakdown here about pe what people want to see in the next mayor of New Orleans. What does some of your data show when it comes to what the job, uh, what what you look for in the job and what voters want to see. That as a mayor, you have to really wear a lot of hats. You have to know and be uh, very well versed in public safety and the criminal justice system, system. You're the one who's going to have to come up with a strategy to deal with the crime system. Um, you've got to have knowledge about economic development. Um, you need to basically be a civil engineer uh, to understand what's going on with the infrastructure uh, situation. You have to be an expert on flood control. Uh, you have to be an expert on public administration, on bureaucracies, uh, on you know what, what kind of policies um, are going to be offered because policies are all, all interconnect. Um, you have to know about city services and you have to understand civil service. And that's, so, that's a big, it's a lot of hats people are wearing yes, right there. Yes. And so one of the questions about the candidates this round is that none of them really have any executive experience. Um, we have Latoya Cantrell coming off the city council. And we, then we have the two judges. And being a judge is much different than being a mayor. You know, as the judge in the courtroom, you're the sovereign authority. Uh, when you're the mayor, there are people who can resist you and tell you no, uh, primarily council members and probably- Happens all the time. Yes. And so it'll be interesting to see um, how that question is addressed because that's be, well, that would be one of the things I want to know. You lack executive experience. What makes you qualified for this position? What does Sidney Torres not getting into this race mean, given the fact that in the commercials he's been running that continue to run after he made his announcement on Friday, he says he's going to financially back a candidate. He already set up a PAC, and he's got the money to financially back whoever he wants. What does his decision, one, not getting in the race, but two, financially backing a candidate mean for this race? Well, not getting in the race meant uh, that there was no celebrity, no real star quality in the race. And I think that's what a lot of people were kind of hoping for, was that this kind of jazz up the election, particularly the media. Um, and he is going to form a PAC. Uh, my understanding is that the PAC he's going to form is going to be much more issue and policy based. Um, he's not necessarily interested in forming a PAC to back candidates per se. He's interested in policy studies, um, looking at issues. What are the best practices in other cities, other states? States that then we can implement here. He's got a lot of money, and if he dumps a lot of money into this pack, we all know how ad buys go when it comes to ads for candidates pro and against. Can he sway this election if he gets financially behind a candidate? Uh, I mean, it's possible. Uh, endorsements can be helpful for candidates. Um, you know, I, I probably along, among the business class, since he's a businessman, that he might be able to sway some of those individuals into uh, not just supporting the candidates with their vote, but supporting them financially as well. Uh, so we'll have to see who he endorses. So politics gets nasty. We've all seen on the national level we've seen it locally here as well things get heated during elections just look past look back to 2015 to the governor's race john bell edwards essentially ran a campaign attacking david vitter the entire time you look at the past senate races with bill cassidy against mary landrew one how ugly do you expect this race to get and two has it already started given the fact that a well-known city councilwoman came to the courthouse on friday <laughs> and threw out an allegation in stacy head that she already is hearing pay to play rumors from people. Yes, uh, one of the concerns is that the city will kind of slide back to its pre-Katrina machine type politics, uh, where it is pay to play, where you know if you want to sit at the table uh, and be able to get city contracts, you're gonna have to basically pay the machine and then the machine returns that favor to you and about on that city contract. Um, so that's one of the things we should be looking for. Um, so hopefully the Inspector General uh, and the U.S. Attorney will be very 
paying very close attention. Also, do you expect a lot of attack ads? It just it seems like it's the, the way to do business nowadays. Whether it's right or wrong, it seems like no matter what election cycle it is, attack ads are something that have become not the exception but the rule. Uh, negative ads are always employed in campaigns and because they work. Um, the goal of negative campaigns is to suppress the support for your opponent. It's not about generating your people to get out and vote. It's about convincing your opponent supporters, oh, this person's not worth voting for, just stay home. So we'll see attack ads. Uh, you know, politics is conflictual. Uh, there's only one mayor and it's a very powerful position and you've got a number of people who are seeking that position and and so that means there's going to be a lot uh, of what I would probably call a full contact campaign. Final question here, does anybody seek the endorsement of current mayor Mitch Landrieu? Right now he seems to be very unpopular given the crime problem as well as the monument issue but if you look at all the other things that he has done a lot of people say this is a mayor who's got a lot done when it comes to budgetary issues infrastructure issues will any of these candidates one seek his endorsement and two what does it mean if he does get behind a candidate uh, I agree if you take the long view on his tenure as mayor he's done a pretty good job right um, and the, the, there has been this recent uptick in crime and the monuments has kind of tarnished his legacy um, and so at this point he seems to be relative somewhat radioactive so I'm not sure anyone's really out there seeking his endorsement um, I would suspect maybe when it comes to the runoff, if there is a runoff, and I expect there to be a runoff given so. the right. number of candidates, uh, then he may decide, you know, to toss his endorsement in there. Does that does that pull any weight with voters in the city of New Orleans? Um, again, it's hard to say. Uh, the, the, the mayor's, you know, last time we polled on the mayor's approval, he was at 60% 60, 60 job approval, and that was 2016. And so I don't suspect his numbers have gone down that much. So there's, there's still some people out there who support him. Good. All right. Dr. Ed Shervinek, University of New Orleans, we always appreciate your time. On top of the mayor's race, they have all the council races, sheriff, coroner, every elected office in the city of New Orleans. We have a complete breakdown on all of our mobile apps and at WDSU.com. For the hot seat, I'm Travers Mackle. Juliana, let's send it back to you at the news desk.